sometime ago, uh, the speaker, Dr. Raz Richard, wrote a letter uh, to Professor Anthony Butler, HOD of Policy Department, where he teaches at the University of uh, Cape Town. And then, um, in the manner which is introduced, in the afternoon of the 24th August 2016, the HOD of Politics at UCT addressed to me a letter whose content we shall in a moment discuss about. He opens the letter with the following situation, and salutation, dear Loazi. He could as well have written Dr. Loazi, Lushar. It would have not made any difference. For I, have, for I cannot say with certainty what I, in his modern imaginary present. Accordingly, I have permitted myself to be to the liberty of leading him to the abyss where it dwells, where it dwells the shattered fragments of, of my being, so he may recognize me for what and who I am. I am of those whose skin color makes them objects of scorn and disregard. I am one with the black children of Masikumelele, Elizamoyeti, Kukuyeti, and other black slams who, with their tender, Bad black boys play all day long in stagnant pools of discarded bathing water, urine, visceral blood, vomit of drunken black souls, and perhaps discharged from the vagrant abortion performed on the body too young to bear life. Yeah. I am one with those in this country who grow up certain that success is destined to elude them because they are black. For us it remains dark even though the day should have started. We are of a race that has no knowledge to offer more in South Africa. Our form of cognizing both of being in the world, our well touch hand. Can not be admitted to credence. They fall outside the bounds of the of modern disciplinary religions. More precisely, our forms of knowledge are incomprehensible to the ideological sciences of man. Dr. Mazrushawa, this is part of the letter he wrote, and this is how he identifies himself. That's I'm saying it's difficult to introduce somebody who has not an introduction. He has a BA, BA honors from the University of Transkei, a master's in philosophy from the University of Ibadan, Nigeria, a master's philosophy from the Center for, uh, for Studies in Social Sciences in Kolkata, and a PhD from the University of Vettbatesland. He has taught at Fort Hill and Bates. He has a health visiting fellowship at the African Studies Center, Label, Label, and Netherlands. Lucian's interests include political philosophy, in particular German phenomenology and Enlightenment philosophy. Sanderton studies open various books like the colonial of art, the politics of representation, and post-colonial theory. African politics, including African political economy and post-political African state, the radical African or black tradition of intellectual thought. His publication include Hendrik C. and Michel, edition, edition book from the National Liberation of Democratic Renaissance in South and Africa, Dakar. And Michel, uh, 2009, Development of Modernity, Modernity and Development, as well as Cordesira uh, Arjuna Rasta. His colleagues, um, join me to welcome Dr. Michel to give us. Um, someone? Yeah. Ninja, I'm 
that it is our material oppression or our material depravity that results in our oppression. I want to suggest that it is something else. I want to suggest that what results in our oppression is not material depravity. It is not that we don't have land. There is something else that we need to attend to. Because, to perhaps preemptively make my point, do you think that when we have land, white people will respect us? No. So it means there's something else that we need to attend to to attain our liberation. Because we may have the land, it won't change white people's attitude towards us. So what is it that, what's the condition of possibility that makes it possible for white people to think of themselves as superior to us, even when materially they are poor or inferior? Because a poor white person knows that he or she is superior to you. It doesn't matter how rich you are. <laughs> so that is why the useless notion of black privilege must be dispensed with. There's nothing like black privilege. Because those black people who think of themselves as privileged, when whiteness encounters them in the expensive restaurants, it doesn't say you are privileged. White people beat them up. And then we have to support them. Whereas yesterday they were telling us that they are privileged. So why is it that when they get to these expensive restaurants, privilege does not protect them? <laughs> so there is something else that needs to be attended to, and that's what I call cognitive domination. Now to set this discussion off, I thought I would begin from a text that would be familiar to students of anthropology. It's a text written in 1983 by Johannes Fabian, How Anthropology Makes Its Other. Mm -hmm. The book is basically a critique of methodology, or rather of, of the methodological you know, approaches or the method of anthropology called ethnography. What are the limitations of ethnography? But I'm not going to focus on the limitations of ethnography. What I want to retrieve from that text by Johannes Fabian is a quotation that I want to read to you and I quote. He says, there is nowadays much talk about the political and moral complicity of our discipline with the colonial enterprise. Much remains to be said about cognitive complicity. So what Johannes Fabian draws our attention to is the fact that we've criticized anthropology for having been to the service of colonial administration and for having aided colonialism. You would remember, I'm sure, um, a text edited by Talal Asad, um, Anthropology and Colonial Domination. Basically, in it, he sets out, together with the other people who contribute to the text, he sets out to demonstrate how anthropology was central to the project of colonialism. So what Johannes Fabian here draws our attention to is the fact that we have said enough about anthropology's complicity politically and morally with colonialism. But Johannes Fabian says what we haven't spoken about enough is the cognitive complicity of anthropology. What it doesn't do though is to tell us what is this cognitive complicity, what does it mean by cognitive complicity of anthropology to this project of colonial domination. It is this that I want to pick up and develop, you know, expansively what cognitive domination means and how it plays itself out in South Africa today. And how we, as we sit here today, are basically subjects and victims of this cognitive domination and how perhaps we may be able to free ourselves, you know, from that cognitive domination. Now, as I've said, the theme under which I want us to, to, to have a conversation this afternoon is cognitive domination of the black colonizers of South Africa. But in order to be able to make my point, I need to start somewhere else. I need to start by observing that colonialism in Africa took different forms. There were different kinds of colonial domination in the continent. So there were basically two forms of colonies in Africa. 
Throughout the continent, colonialism took one of two forms. Now, I'm going to draw this distinction because South Africa that we're talking about falls into one of these categories of colonial domination. And in order for us to be able to apprehend what cognitive domination means, we have to understand the particularity or the specificity of colonialism in South Africa today. Now, as we've said, colonialism in Africa took two forms. There was on the one hand what we call colonies of domination. There was on the other what we call colonies of settlement or settler colonies. So there was colonies of domination, and there was, on the other hand, settler colonies. What distinguishes these two colonies, or these two kinds of colonial domination? Colonies of domination were largely geographically found in West Africa. Nigeria, Ghana, Burkina Faso, Togo, and the whole of the West Coast. On the other hand, colonies of settlement were found most like, or mostly, in Southern Africa and parts of East Africa. South Africa, Angola, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Namibia, parts of Tanzania and Kenya. So settler colonialism prevailed largely in Southern Africa and parts of the East Coast. If we push or if we stretch a bit further this distinction between colonies of domination and colonies of settlement, we would find that colonies of domination gained their independence very early. Colonies of domination got their liberation or their freedom in the 1960s. In fact, 1960 was basically the year of independence. But countries that basically gained their independence in 1960 were colonies of domination. Colonies of settlement were very late in gaining their independence, as opposed to colonies of settlement. I mean, rather as opposed to colonies of domination. Colonies of settlement began gaining their independence very late, beginning with Angola and Mozambique in 1975, followed by Namibia in 1980, and Zimbabwe in 1980 rather followed by Zimbabwe in 1980, Namibia in 1989, lastly South Africa in 1994. So you can see that there is a certain trajectory. Settler colonialism are very late in gaining their independence. So when the winds of change were blowing through the continent, basically colonies of settlement were able to resist those winds of change. The question must be, how did colonies of settlement continue to survive even when the whole world, including the United Nations, including all other international organizations, had already declared that colonialism was an untenable system. Let us trace even further, or rather let us distill even further this, this difference between colonies of settlement and colonies of domination. You will find, looking closely, that colonies of domination mostly gained their independence through peaceful means. So there were usually conferences convened, you know, either in London or in France or anywhere, and out of that conference, you know, there would be an argument, you know, leading to the independence of that particular colony. On the other hand, colonies of settlement gained their independence via armed liberation struggle. So eventually all colonies of settlement, violence had to be brought to bear in order to bring about liberation. It is not just that you had countries that gained their independence through peaceful means and other countries that gained their independence via armed liberation struggle. It is what this teaches us and what this tells us about South Africa today that I want us to to distill out of that distinction. One is the fact that all colonies of settlement, as a result, have a very tolerant attitude towards violence. The culture of violence is a generalized culture in colonies of settlement. In fact, if you want to think about this in a Fanonian way, Fanon says that violence becomes cathartic 
it becomes liberatory. It is only violence that, be, that brings about liberation. The reason why Fanon says so is because he is also studying a colony of settlement called Algeria. Algeria also had, just like other colonies of settlement, had to fight an armed liberation struggle. So it is for this reason that at a certain point in the political life of a settler colony, violence is considered progressive. Mm -hmm. Violence attains a progressive you know, outlook. For those of us who grew up in South Africa in the 1980s, 70s and 80s, we knew that to own a gun was progressive. It was a thing of pride if you owned a gun because you were considered progressive. This is because the other side, the obvious of this that we didn't know at the time was that in all settler colonies, and this is very uh, specific, or rather this is very common between South Africa and the United States of America, which is another settler colony. It is that in all settler colonies, every settler family had a gun. In, in all settler colonies, it was an unwritten rule of settler colonialism. Every settler family had, had to have a gun. If you look closely today, there is no white family that doesn't have a gun. It was part of the culture of settler colonies that settlers needed to be able to protect themselves against the natives against the possibility of violence from the natives. The slaveholders in America also had to have guns because the possibility of a slave rebellion was an everyday possibility. And so the slave owners and the slave master needed to be able to defend himself and his family. So colonies of settlement have a very tolerant attitude towards violence. You know, to give you an example of how this plays itself out in South Africa today, if I told you now that, you know, on my way here, I saw someone, you know, who claimed that it was his wife that he was beating up, the first question we are going to ask is, what had she done? Isn't it? <laughs> what does it matter what she had done? She's a human being. She's not something to be beating up. <laughs> It doesn't matter. So you are asking an irrelevant question. What had she done? She's not something to be beaten up. But because you come from a colony of settlement where violence is thought of as one of the possible mechanisms for resolving disagreement, you think that violence is acceptable because then if I gave you what you would consider to be a legitimate rationalization, you'd say, oh, maybe he was justified. It is because you think that even if there was a disagreement, violence is one way of resolving it. Violence is not a way of resolving disagreement. But in colonies of settlement, because the political culture in colonies of settlement is still in violence, we consider violence to be but one of the methods of resolving you know, political impact. So, this is the distinction, or this is part of the distinction between colonies of settlement and colonies of domination. And as I've said, it plays itself out today in the everyday lives of colonies of settlement. We see it in our lives you know, today, every day. So, if the colonies of settlement are characterized by a culture of violence, it means then that we are going to think about colonialism as having been sustained by military domination only. Now, I think this is where we miss it. We think of colonialism as having been political domination primarily and perhaps if you are a Marxist, you think of it as having been material domination, and it ends there. So I want to suggest that this distinction between colonies of domination and colonies of settlement enables us to see a certain reality about settler colonies 
But that reality is what we have called cognitive, you know, domination. <clears throat> now, in order then to be able to realize what this cognitive domination or how this cognitive domination plays itself out, particularly in settler colonies. So my focus is going to be on settler colonies because South Africa is a settler colonial society and it continues to be today a settler colonial society. So in order to be able to show you how cognitive domination plays itself out in settler colonies, I want to take you back to a study that was done um, by Lord Heide in 1945. Now, Lord Heide wrote a book, you know, a huge compendium titled The African South. What Lord Heide does in this text, you know, amongst other things, is to survey the kind of training that was afforded to all colonial administrators. And he focuses on all the colonies, but we're going to zero in on British colonies and British colonial officials because South Africa would later become a British colony, you know, following um, the takeover of the Cape in 1806 by the British from the Dutch. So what Lord Haile does in this important study and African survey is to tell us that all colonial administrators, before they were sent to the colonies, they had to undergo preparatory training before they were sent to the different colonies. Now, this preparatory training that was given to all colonial administrators was not military training, Lord Hyde tells us. Now, because we want to focus on British colonies, Lord Hyde is very informative about the institutions that were established in order to prepare colonial administrators who were going to be sent to the colonies. The two most important institutions in the British Empire that were established for this purpose was Cambridge and Oxford. The University of Oxford and Cambridge University. Now, when this university started, they were basically civil service universities. This is where civil servants were trained. They basically focused on training civil servants, but more specifically in training colonial civil servants. So those who were going to be sent into, you know, the huge British Empire at the time, you know, went to Oxford and Cambridge in order to receive, you know, um, preparatory training. So. As we've said, to reiterate, virtually every colonial administrator, before being sent to the colonies, had to undergo specific training or preparatory training that would enable him or her perform his or her duties in the colonies. Now, as Lord Haile tells us, and I want to quote him here specifically or directly, the training that these colonial officials underwent entailed several things. And I want to read, you know, Lord Hyler's explication of what this training entailed. And I quote, The courses of training provided at Oxford and Cambridge for officers appointed to the African Administrative Service include the study of anthropology. He continues, the International Institute of African Languages and Cultures, with the support of Rockefeller Grant, launched a five-year plan of research to be directed to the effect on African societies of their contact with European influences. Now let, let us get what Lord Hyde is driving at here. What these colonial administrators were trained at was the reactions of the colonized to their colonization. You know, they're giving it a nice name. What are going to be the responses of the Africans as a result of the, in, or rather, culture contact? In anthropology, they teach this as culture contact. What happens when two cultures meet, you know? Precisely what this was about was, you must understand the culture of the people we are going to dominate 
and whose cultures you are going to dominate. And you must understand how they are going to respond to that domination so that you can preempt even their resistance. So this was the intention of training that was afforded to colonial administrators. Now what is key here is the fact that we must understand the legacy of universities in the colonial project. So when universities were established even in the colonies in South Africa, they were not established with an express purpose of producing knowledge. They were established for the express purpose of understanding the culture of those who are going to dominate, how are they going to respond to their domination, and how do you preempt their response. So when universities are established in South Africa, they do not have an honest or a noble cause towards knowledge. Why people fool us every day and tell us that, you know, they establish universities in order to pursue knowledge. I mean, we were not objects, you know, of, 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 of pursuing. The point about this is the fact that as early as the beginning of the colonial project, White colonial settlers realized that the domain of thought was going to be necessary as a site of contestation for the success of colonialism. There was an early recognition that colonialism will not succeed simply on the basis of military dominance. You needed something else in order to be able to go and colonize. So to, to reiterate the point, what Lord Halle makes us realize is that when universities are established, it is with an express purpose of preempting resistance of the colonized, but also it is to ensure that those who are going to dominate us know how to respond to resistance. a 
subject of contestation. It's a sign of struggle. So when universities were established, they were established as participants in this project. Now, when colonialism is established, as we said, in order to succeed, it also had to consider the domain of thought as a site of struggle. So it is that when universities were established in South Africa, you could see that they were established with an express object of advancing colonial administration or colonial domination. Because, to give you an example, on the history of the history of two universities in South Africa. The history of the University of Cape Town where I work and the history of the Bedford University. When the University of Bedford was established, it started as a mining college. It was called the Johannesburg College of Mining. It was only through the program uh, a government proclamation in 1918 that it became a fully-fledged university. When it became a fully-fledged university from being a mining college, the first faculty that was established after those that were existing was something called the Institute of Bantu Studies. Why would a Johannesburg College of Mining now having the privilege of becoming a fully-fledged university think that the very first faculty it must establish outside of the existing you know, disciplines must be the Institute of Bantu Studies. Why not a cognate faculty of engineering or a cognate faculty of you know, uh, science that would aid and abet what they were already doing? It was simply because they had to answer a simple question. At the time, they had to answer a simple question, how are you going to be able to dominate as labor those that you are going to need who are the black colonizers? And so you need uh, the mining college to be able to dominate the miners. So you needed to study the miners in order to be able to dominate them. Remember that very early, it's like colonialism in South Africa complains about how black people led the notion of wage labor. And so they were not willing to subject themselves to wage labor. And so you needed to be able to dominate them so that they willingly subject themselves, you know, to wage labor. In America, this project had a different name. When social sciences were established in America, they had to answer a question. What happens when you no longer own labor in its person? Meaning that what happens when you no longer own slaves? Because when they were slaves, you could force them to work. So you had their labor. So social sciences in America, just like South Africa, had to answer the question, what happens when you no longer own labor in its person? So it was the same thing in South Africa. The history of the University of Cape Town is not too far different. The University of Cape Town starts in 1828, 1829 rather, as you know, the South African College. In 1918 also through the same proclamation it becomes a fully fledged university. One of the very early faculties that are established at the University of Cape Town is something that was called the Centre for Native Life and Languages. Again, the question must be, why are South African universities so obsessed with the native? If we can't answer that question fully now, what we can say is that right from the beginning, for us, the black colonized, we enter these universities as objects of knowledge, as objects to be studied. They never thought of us as people who produce knowledge, no. We were objects to be studied. You study the natives. And so we have continued to exist in these universities as objects of knowledge. Now, if you want me to demonstrate the point, again, I'll take an example from my research methodology classes. Um, I teach postgrad students, and they come to me, they say, 
I want to do a study on how households spend their income. So I say, okay, sounds good. And they would say, you know, they want to know, you know, on what do these households spend their income? You know, how much do they spend on food, how much do they spend on whatever else? I said, that's very good. And where do you want to do the study? And often if it's in Cape Town, they'll say, no, I'll go to Kailicha or to Kukule to, to, you know, uh, all the bad locations. I said, okay, that's very good. What are you going to do? I'm going to interview these families. So hopefully I can gather, I can go to the Dhamidis, the Msumis, and ask them, you know, how do you spend your income? Okay. I said, okay, let's proceed with this study. Very good. But what I want you to do, I want you to shift your sight. You are not going to go to Kukuleto or Kailicha, you are going to go to Constantia, yeah. where white people live. I want you to do precisely what you wanted to do. Gather the Shaminis and ask them, ask an elderly woman who's old enough to be your mother, you know, who's old enough to be your grandmother, ask her how much do you earn, what do you spend your money on. So what I want you to do is to go gather the West Hazens and ask Mr. West Hazen to sit here with his wife and their children and ask them what do they spend their money on. Suddenly it seems impossible. Yeah. Why does it suddenly seem impossible? Suddenly it was possible when you were going to go gather and interview black people, isn't it? Yes. Why is it now that the same thing you are going to do, why does it seem impossible now? It is because black people are always available as objects of knowledge. White people are not available as objects of knowledge. They are subjects of knowledge. They are the ones who produce knowledge. And we have perpetuated that cycle of producing ourselves as objects of knowledge rather than as people who are also subjects of knowledge. Now, a second example to demonstrate the point is, you know, tourists um, come to this country. At will, when tourists come to this country, they take your photograph. They don't ask you whether you want to be photographed. <laughs> now, it seems laughable, but reverse the scale. Take your camera, go to an expensive suburb in Joburg, and begin taking random white people pictures. Suddenly, it becomes a problem. So why is it a simple thing when a white person takes your rug, takes Black people run of pictures without asking them their permission, and when we do the same thing, it becomes impossible. It is simply because black people have been produced as available objects of knowledge, and white people as subjects of knowledge. So if you ask that white person, why are you doing that, they might as well answer you, I mean, don't you know, that's how the world is structured. <laughs>
And so because they are subjects of knowledge, you can't shine the light on them. So, it is this other kind of domination, cognitive domination, that is at work when that happens. But we haven't quite established this cognitive domination. At this point, we are asserting it. We are using examples to assert it, but we haven't established how, what are its mechanics and what is its technology. So, in order not to then get ahead of ourselves, again, I want to return to you, return you to the book that I referred to by Lord Hyde, so that we may understand the mechanics of cognitive domination. I want to return you to the book by Lord Hyde titled The African Survey. Here, at this point, Lord Hyde surveys the different institutions but not only the different institutions, what was taught in these institutions as he had done earlier on. But there is a different take in this instance, because Lord Haile is talking about a different kind of institutions. These are institutions that were meant, in fact we must, I think, follow him as he makes the point, you know, um, himself. Again, to make the point clear, here, Lord Haile surveys the institutions and courses that were available through each of Europe's colonial powers and the kind of training that was offered in these institutions. Now, things become interesting when it turns to Germany. Now, I took this example rather than a British example because Germany is very important in the history of settler colonialism because of Namibia, which is right next to us. Now here is what he says about these institutions and training in Germany, and he writes, In Germany, there are schools for the training of intending settlers and their wives, which give elementary instruction in anthropology. Of these, the most important are at Wisthaisen for men and at Sonderberg for women. Let's return to the first line. There are schools for the training of intending settlers. Now, you know, um, I, I don't know who was speaking, and whether it was the MC, you know, he was afraid to call white people, white people are saying diversity. White people are white people, they are settlers. You must call them settlers. <laughs> Without pointing a gun at them. 
such that people acquiesce to their own domination. And they come to consider their domination as normal and acceptable. Now, again here, this is where we must dispense with white liberalism. You know, there are white people who say, oh, but I have very good relations with black people. You know, uh, those who work for me, I take good care of them. <laughs> Racism and secular colonialism is not dependent on the individual predilections of white people. It's a systematic thing. It's a structural thing. It does not depend so that even when all white people have raised their hands and said, I'm not racist, racism does not end. Racism continues because it's a structure that perpetuates itself. So we must never be fooled by individual liberals who then say that, you know, we are on the side of black people. Yeah. They must leave us alone. Yeah. We will figure out our problems. Yeah. <laughs> because even when they claim to be on our side, the structure treats them differently from us. You know, there is, there is a very insulting history of struggle in this country. You know, the, the older generation of nationalist leaders, and this is coming to me as I'm talking, you know, who always, who always tell us, oh, you know, Tabo is very good at it. You know, uh, some of me. Uh, you know, he always reminds us when I, we had good friends, you know, who invited us, white friends who invited us to their houses. We had drinks, you know, in their houses. Now, look at it. Look at the structure of that relationship. We are always invited. <laughs> we are never the one to invite them. You know, to, 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 to. So, we are always there to be entertained in their will. And then you consider that friendship. You know, and, and, and but the point here is so there are schools, as Lord Hyde tells us, for the training of intending settlers and their wives. In these schools, as we've said, the purpose was to prepare the settlers for the eventuality of them living amongst the natives that they were going to dominate, where they were not going to have the benefit of military training. So in the language of military science, you could think of this as psychological warfare. But it was not quite psychological warfare, you know. What comes closer to it would be an exposition in Albert Mabie's work. You know, Albert Mabie is an Algerian revolutionary scholar who wrote a book titled The Colonizer and the Colonizer. How basically the colonizer relates to the colonized. And Albert Mabie actually, as he wrote the book, he says he thought that the Marxist, so he did what is called the psychoanalytic analysis of the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized. Because his point was that the Marxists have emphasized the material basis of domination. What according to him, they hadn't looked at was what a psychoanalysis or what a perspective coming from a psychoanalytic relationship between the colonizer and the colonized would reveal because according to him, what the colonizer needed was to create certain myths about the colonized in order to justify domination. Now what are the myths? There are many who live with them today. Black people are lazy. You know, we live. We built the highways of this country from our muscles. We dug gold and diamonds and platinum from deep, deep down underneath. And today we are lazy. Yeah. Suddenly we've become lazy when we built all these structures with our physical might and no pain. But when it suits white people today, they say we are lazy. When they want to exclude us at UCT, that racist university I teach in, <laughs> When they want to exclude black South Africans from professors, you know, from the professoriate, from postgraduate studies, they say black South African students are lazy. These are the myths that Albert Mabe analyzes in the colonizer and the colonizer. You create these myths in order then that you justify treating people in a certain way. You know that it's not true. 
But you see, the importance of a myth, that's precisely why it's called a myth. The myth's truthness, truthfulness is in its effect. It's not in the myth itself. <laughs> it's whether it has the desired effect. So you say black South Africans are lazy, that's why they are not in the classroom. You are justifying the effect that you've excluded us for centuries from universities. And you still want to continue excluding us today. Mm -hmm. And so you fabricate a myth mm -hmm. that we are lazy. Mm -hmm. So it is that colonialism did precisely that in creating myths. And that's what Albert Mabey, you know, does in the <coughs> colonizer and the colonized looking at the myths that were perpetuated in order to garble the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized. And in a sense, you could think you know, of this interaction between the colonizer and the colonized as being governed by a certain ethic. And so, this was the purpose of this training. It was to give white people the ethic of a proper relationship between a native and the colonized, the white settler and the black colonizer. Think of it. The relationship between a white household, a white madam and a black servant is the same everywhere, whether you're in South Africa or in America. It's the same everywhere. The relationship between a black servant and a white master is the same. They expect the same things from, from, from the black colonized. You don't talk to them wearing a hat, you must hold your head, you must genuflect when you talk to them. You know, and all of those things. The structure is universal. This is the preparatory training they went to, or they went through in these institutions. Such that, as I've said, colonialism or racism does not depend on individual settlers. This is where you see the collective structural form of racism, particularly settler colonialism, because when one white person tries to be free and open, which is itself an impossibility, you know, tries to be open and free with black people. It is the other white people who then firstly say to him or her, but you know, you are going to demystify us to the natives. You are becoming too close in your proximity with them because their fear is that you might then reveal our weaknesses to them. Or suddenly they might, have, might come as a result of your interaction with them, they might come to realize that we are actually ordinary human beings just like them. Whereas they have created this mythical image of a white person as full of vitality and never ending intellect. You know, there is, there is, in the history of colonialism, um, British colonialists were very ardent at this. Once British colonial administrators were nearing retirement, once you began to be frail, at late 50s, early 60s, you were shipped out of the colonies because the black colonized were not supposed to see a white colonizer frail and weak. In Nigeria, when Nigeria gained independence, or rather, when many of these left Nigeria, many of these British colonial administrators, you know, had to be shipped out of Nigeria because they were reaching my late majority and they were becoming frail and they were going to demystify the image of the white colonizer is always vital and you know healthy. Many of them came to South Africa. And many of them settled in Cape Town. Now one of the quarrels between South Africa and Nigeria very early in the attainment of independence was the fact that many of them continued to claim pensions from Nigeria. Because they had been in the colonial service. You know, and they had to be paid, you know, they are they are pensions. But that's that's the point here is that for the colonizer there had to be a certain image. But in order to be able to prop up this image, they created all sorts of myths. Myths that then enabled to treat the native in a certain way, or the colonized, the black colonized in a certain way. So when you say the natives are lazy. That justifies whipping them to work because they are unwilling, they are always unwilling to work. So when you say that their cultures are savage cultures, you then justify turning them into, you know, parrots of Western culture. So when you say 
that they buy wives, you know, as if these are people who had a sense of commodity. You know, when you say Lobola is a form of buying a wife, you know, uh, you then justify abolishing their cultures because you yeah. already painted their cultures in a certain way yeah. in order to rationalize your own actions towards them. So, the whole study of anthropology and study of, you know, native cultures was basically aimed at justifying colonial domination because then, don't you hear, you know, the black colonized from time to time saying that, well, if it was not for white people, we would still be mired in the times of old. It is because when people painted a picture of the times of old as times of barbarism, as times of, you know, savagery. Now, but they don't tell us what this savagery in actuality was. But as I near the end, what I do want to emphasize and return our case back to South Africa today as a settler colonial society is that we can see how cognitive domination continues to structure the relations in the South African Academy. Cognitive domination basically continues to structure the Academy in South Africa in this one very obvious sense. Now anyone who observes South African universities and the South African Academy very closely, and I want to enlarge the Academy, that's why I'm saying South African universities and the Academy, I want to enlarge this to include other institutions of knowledge and thought that are not just the universities because Thought is not produced only in the universities. Thought is produced in several other spaces, you know, uh, other than the universities. So anyone who observes very closely the South African, you know, universities and the academy would see that, will not fail to see that it is structuring and functioning. The South African academy and the intellectual world thrusts upon the white scholars and the white settler scholars, the responsibility to write and produce knowledge about society. Now this responsibility is not the narrow sense of having white professors and everyone else. This responsibility is in the sense that you will see in the South African intellectual scene that it is white people who have the responsibility, it seems natural that they have the responsibility not only to produce knowledge, but to produce knowledge and thought that then structures society. Now, one of the failures of the post-colonial you know, South African reform is the fact that universities were never transformed in order that we may, as black people, enter these universities and upon finishing live with a sense of responsibility that we also have a responsibility to produce thought and knowledge that structures society. That right to produce thought and knowledge that structures society was never democratized. What happened is that we were allowed to enter these universities as physical bodies. We enter these universities in order to acquire qualifications and then go and work. So we think of the universities basically as places where we black people go, acquire education and qualifications and then go and work. So the value of universities for us is places that prepare us in order to go and work. We don't think of universities as places that prepare us and give upon us a right to produce thought that will structure society. Whereas white people go to the universities and produce knowledge and thought that then structures society. So we remain dependent on white people for that kind of knowledge and thought that is produced with an intent to structure society. Now, because that is not a very tangible right, when we fight and, and demonstrate for decolonized, fee-free education, often we do not mention this right because it's not a tangible thing. You can't see it, but when you study closely the structuring and functioning of the South African Academy, you see that it is white people who still have the responsibility to produce thought that structures society. 
Now let me demonstrate if it's not clear enough. In South Africa, you have something called the South African Institute for Race Relations. What is it called? Institute of Race Relations. Institute of Race Relations. South African Institute of Race Relations. It's supposed to help us think about the problem of racism and you know races in South Africa. Now the problem of racism in South Africa is a white creation. It was created by white settler colonizers. Who owns the South African Institute of Race Relations? It's white people. So you first cause us the problem of racism. But again, you think of yourself as being possessed of the right to resolve the very problem you created for us. And for white people, there is no contradiction in this. For them, there is no contradiction in this because they go to universities and, and come out possessed of the right to produce thought that structures society. For us, universities are places to go and earn qualifications and go and earn cheap salaries. So, it is that, again in South Africa, you have a problem of public transport. Everyone who lives in this country would know that there is a problem of public transport in this country. Now this problem was created by white people who simply refused to allow a system of public transport in this country because for themselves, they were all going to own cars at the back of our exploitation. So they didn't need public transport. But today, it is the very white people who speak loudest about a non-functional or a dysfunctional public transport system. Not only do they speak loudest about a dysfunctional public transport system, they actually also raise their hands first and say, we can offer you solutions. <laughs> now, you would not be able to locate where this arrogance comes from. It comes from that right, that sense of responsibility that white people think they have in order to produce knowledge that shapes society. Whereas we don't think in that term. We don't think in those terms. Do you study here so that you may offer solutions to the country? Yes. How are you going to offer solutions to the country? By going to work for government. <laughs> <laughs> the truth of it is that you are going to realize the veil of your education by how much you are going to be earning. Because education for you is a commodity for. It's a commodity that enables you to consume other commodities. So for as long as they don't see you at home buying a car, buying a house and consuming conspicuously, they aren't able to say you are doing well. So the point is that as a result, we remain then as black people who cognitively depend on white people. So when white people take this right, to cognitively drive society, to use ideas in order to drive the movement of society forward. When they take that responsibility, they do not take it as an honest responsibility, they take it as a responsibility that enables them to dominate us. So that we can come to see that domination as normal. So, as I said, I'm quite close to, to, to concluding there's a point that I want to emphasize about how we have come to accept this domination, this cognitive domination. So in this country, because black people have not evolved a theory of the black aesthetic, what, what is a theory of the black aesthetic, you know? We watch all sorts of absurdities called generations and all those things, which are supposedly about, you know, black entertainment. Now, if you, if you watch Generations, there's something that will strike you if you are an observant student. That's why I'm saying your university education is useless as you think of it, because yeah. you haven't picked this up. Yeah, that's true. If you watch Generations, there's something very repulsive about it. It is the fact that every time skill has to appear, Every time skill has to appear in generations, when a medical doctor has to appear in generations, how does he appear? And you accept it. 
So when a doctor has to be found, it has to be a white doctor. Aren't there black doctors in this country? Why haven't you protested that generations have portrayed the reality that perpetuates cognitive domination? It's because your education does not enable you to recognize that. Black people, but they don't call them black people, they call them the working class. 
And the rich people are the bourgeois. Where do they fit? They, these white scholars, in this, where do they fit? Whereas, if you call this other one black and this other one is white, we know that you also fit into the category of white people who are rich because they are white, and they are white because they are rich. And these ones are poor because they are black, and they are black because they are poor, not because of their working class.
A childlike human cannot be a bad human. For are we not in spiritual matter, bidding to be like unto little children? Perhaps as a direct result of this temperament, the African is the only happy human I've come across. No other race is so easily satisfied, so good tempered, so carefree. It has, if this had not been the case, it could scarcely have survived the intolerable evils which have weighed on it like a nightmare through the ages. A race which could survive the immemorial practice of the slave trader and preserve its inherent simplicity and sweetness of disposition must have some very fine moral qualities. The African easily forgets past troubles. This happy-go-lucky disposition is a great asset but it has also its drawbacks. There is no inward incentive to improvement. There is no persistent effort in construction. And there is complete absorption in the present, its joys and sorrows. White women and song in their African forms remain the great consolations of life. These children of nature have not the inner toughness and persistence of the Europeans, nor those social and moral incentives to progress. It is clear that a race so unique and so different in its mentality and cultures from those of Europe requires a policy very unlike that which would suit, very unlike that which would suit Europeans. End of quote. Now let's young Smarts. Remember, Jan Smarts had been Prime Minister of South Africa yeah. and had been President in 1924 yeah. in South Africa. So he goes to Oxford to give these lectures after losing the election. And he actually, in those lectures, insists that apartheid was still possible. Remember, this is 1929 in Britain. Mm -hmm. There's a thinking that colonies must be shifting towards independence. Smart says no. Apartheid is still possible. And he goes on in the subsequent lectures to outline what apartheid would look like. But that's not my concern. What concerns me is to show to you how cognitive domination plays itself out in South Africa today. Now this is the young smart who says such despicable things about us. As black people in this country, where we constitute 86% of the population, and where supposedly we are independent and autonomous as a country. Now, in, at the racist University of Cape Town, where I work, there is a hall of residence named Smarts, named after young Smarts. It is not very uncommon at the University of Cape Town that you are going to meet black <coughs> students wearing sweaters written smart hall. Now it must I demand, how does a black person in a university supposedly going to constitute the critical mass of the black intellectuals? How does a black person become so unreflective that he wears or she wears, it's a male resident, so it's mostly male, that he wears with such pride a sweater written smart, smart who thought so despicably about us. It is cognitive domination. It is that we have accepted that in any case this is our condition. But this came via a subtle maneuver in South Africa. Remember we said that white people ensure that they supply, cognitive domination means that white people supply us with the categories and concepts with which we think about our own reality. Now we arrived at this point where black people who wear sweaters, you know, uh, immemorializing a racist settler called the Ansmart, we arrived at this point through a certain maneuver that white scholars did in South Africa. 
It was that they said what happened in South Africa in 1994 was not independence but democratization. Because if you had allowed 1994 to be called independence, it would have become an occurrence that is comparable to 1960 in the other African countries. And there are things that every country that gains independence does as a synchronon for independence. When you gain independence as a colony, you change colonial names wholesale. You don't need a separate process in order to change those names because precisely independence means that you undo the colonial structures, you undo the colonial names. But because white scholars were smart enough in South Africa to produce thoughts that shape society, they said no. What happened here was democratization not independent. And when you democratize, you set up you know, several structures that would attend to things like names and whatnot. So this is why at UCT today, we are sitting with a hall called Young Smarts. Smarts who insulted us as black people. So in our own country as black people, we venerate someone who insulted us. We immemorialize him with a hall of residence with sweaters that we wear as black students. And this is the part that worries me more. White people did their part. Maybe it was to be expected that they should perpetuate cognitive domination. The people I'm worried more about are me and you, black people. How it is that we just cannot realize that we have responsibility to produce knowledge and thought with which to shape society so that we may not become the laughable stock that we are. I thank you very much.